Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, good morning, everybody. Really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Tim Huang. I'm a researcher at Data and Society. And uh, my talk today is entitled Dashboard Confessional Data Moderation and Privacy. Uh, and it's a new talk, so I'm excited to get people's feedback, uh, particularly for this group that we have here today. And so as the title suggests, I've been only allotted 10 minutes, so I'm going to bite off way more than I can chew, cover a lot of ground uh, with an eye on surfacing a bunch of questions for discussion, which I, I think this group will jump into uh, quite well. So let me go right into it, which is I want to address two quick questions. The first one is, under what circumstances does our interest in moderation conflict with our interest in privacy? And then the second one is, what relevance does this have to the social spaces uh, of the web? And I think that these are really critical questions uh, because if our interest in moderation and if our interest in privacy are in deep conflict, I think they're both values that this community really appreciates and thinks are important, then we have to debate those trade-offs uh, as we push towards a new vision of what the web should look like. Alternatively, if they're only sometimes in conflict, uh, we need a better understanding of how they're in conflict and when they're in conflict. So one way of, I think, getting into this question, addressing this question, is to start from the idea that moderation implies listening. Uh, in fact, moderation implies listening, and put differently, moderation implies data collection. Right? So we can think about this even in a non-online context. So um, if you think about moderators right, or mediators, right, these are a third party that monitors the discussion between parties and is there to basically enforce uh, a set of rules. Uh, but a big part of what a moderator does is listen to what's going on and, and respond uh, accordingly. This also occurs in situations of self-moderation as well. So we can think about the confessional, for example, as a kind of primitive Amazon Mechanical Turk listening device. Right? You speak into a microphone, and it renders certain types of judgments back at you. Uh, and again, data collection is key to the moderating force of the confessional. Right? You need to receive what someone has done or to give them advice on what they should do uh, next. And this rule applies not just for one person or two people, but also scales out to groups or even thinking about moderation at the level of a society. So listening to social and creative activity becomes a critical piece of implementing uh, a system of moderation. So that's executed traditionally in the form of bureaucracies, right? listening machines that take the form of human organizations and processes and rules. So I think here about the production code administration, right? which enforced uh, a sort of system of censorship on film in the United States for a period of time. And again, this was a very kind of large group scale, high costly listening machine. Right? You had to submit a film, get their approval, and only then could it kind of go out and enter uh, the public sphere. So, so far, so good, right? This is actually not very original stuff. This is sort of basic panopticon design 101. Um, and we can make the kind of links pretty explicit as to why listening is really key for moderation, right? On one hand, it creates the basis for action, right? You can't moderate without knowing what the activity is and then assessing that activity. And then, like the panopticon, right, it serves a notice purpose. It lets people know that they're being listened to and therefore they might want to think twice before doing uh, what they're thinking about doing. It's also potentially not very original on the level of political theory as well. right? This is sort of a Leviathan type situation where we've always been confronted with situations where we need to sacrifice liberties and freedoms in order to ensure uh, the third party has ability to kind of regulate societal balance uh, on some level. So I think the, the question, and this is the second question I ask, is, is there anything different this time in the context of the large scaled social spaces uh, of the web? One, I think there's two. right? So one of them uh, is the extent to which activity takes place on a platform mediated by code uh, and is automated to deal with scale. Right? In short, these platforms implement moderation with true listening machines, with actual code and automation. And I think that has a number of implications for how we think about moderation impacting sort of our interests in privacy. Uh, and particularly our exposure to surveillance. So one of them is to automate and scale moderation effectively, you need to structure activity to be visible and legible to machines. Right? That means a couple of things. That means fixed identities right? that you can deactivate to reduce control uh, or access to a platform. It also implies persistent logs of activities uh, that allow you to evaluate whether or not a user is a good actor or a bad actor. And for particularly harmful activity that breaks the law, uh, you may also want to index this data with real-world data. Right? Think about uh, the, the sort of violations of rules uh, in, in the real world. Uh, you, know, you can imagine spam and harassment. 
um, there, there's a sudden connection, a certain pressure to move sort of this data and connect it with what's happening offline and real world uh, identities. It also means that in some cases, adjudication takes place only over a given set of variables, right? The data points uh, that the machine can see, and that renders potentially unfair results because the system only sees a limited set of data points about any individual or any set of people. At the same time, improvements in that might require more disclosure for more users, right? So that our interest in more fair results and moderation may actually lead to less uh, sort of privacy being given to any particular user on that platform. So, this suggests to me that the code-based nature of moderation may push us towards more privacy, or, uh, more moderation than we would otherwise prefer as users. So that's one difference, right? What's, what's potentially another difference uh, about the fact that you know, we've got moderation happening in large online social spaces? Well, so one of them is that societal, uh, so these social spaces are in private hands, right? So it's different from sort of the classical Leviathan framing where you say, okay, we're gonna get together and form a government by the people. Uh, and this has another potential set of pressures on how companies may approach moderation. So one of them is that platforms may have really perverse incentives to seek out what you could call the emo threshold, the engagement maximizing outrage threshold. Uh, that's to say that there's a relative potentially lack of moderation that might be beneficial for a business that's based on attention, advertising, engagement from the users. And obviously this can't be allowed to bubble out of control or else you'll alienate users who will then go away. Uh, but there's potentially an optimizing level of outrage and a lack, relative lack of um, moderation that you might want to implement in the system uh, to, to boost profits, essentially. That there may be a profit motive towards the, the line that we draw between sort of privacy and moderation. Another is that platforms see themselves as platforms in many contexts, right? They, they may just see themselves as passive infrastructure with limited responsibility for what takes place within it. So this is a point that's been made by Sarah Jung and Tarleton Gillespie and a number of others. Uh, and this may make them worry about taking on the responsibility of differentiating between types of content, differentiating between types of activity, and they may actually be reinforced by the law, right? CDA 230 and the DMCA put in certain structures that enforce this kind of approach to so thinking about what a platform is and what its responsibilities are to the content that moves through the network. So this may create hesitance to get involved, um, even in light of obvious crises happening on these platforms. So this suggests to me actually another really interesting thing, which is that the commercial quality of these platforms may have an impact again on the trade-off between moderation and privacy, to which it might pull platforms more towards the privacy direction than a way that we want if we were users creating the platform uh, ourselves. So I think we're, we're left in a really interesting situation when we think about the future of the network and the future of the platform, right? One of them is that the center of gravity of commercial entities uh, is that they will systematically moderate less than we might want them to do. But the challenge of moderating at that scale might be that we have to produce diminishments of privacy that we're also uncomfortable with, right? That like automating moderation at scale uh, may, may create effects that we don't really want either. So then I think obviously the question is how do we find middle paths that provide better trade-offs, right? And some of them have actually percolated around a little bit already. One of them is uh, it might be contextual, right? We may say let's take the platform at its word and force them to put in a level of moderation that corresponds to what they present themselves as. So if you present yourself as a public forum, we may say, okay, well, we're okay with you potentially providing less privacy in this forum for the interests of moderation. Another one might be a call for fragmentation, right? Giving people tools to balance themselves uh, this balance between privacy and moderation in the way that they would want, right? And there's an interesting question about what that fragmentation leads to uh, across platforms of this scale. Um, you can think about filter bubble problems and a number of issues along those lines. So uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I figured I'd surface a lot and actually not have any really great answers, um, but I figured it might set the stage for how we think about the links between listening machines on one hand, privacy on the other, and I think our overwhelming interest in increasing the level of moderation online. So we'd love to chat about it more. Here's the obligatory contact information and uh, figured we would just go straight to q and I guess. So thank you. Let's see if this is working. Hooray. Um, I wanted to take Chair's privilege and, and, and start with a question for you first. Um, one of the things that I'm also finding really interesting about the nature of the listening machine is that it's now become part of the key driver of AI. So a really, really early statement from Bill Gates in the 1980s, he said, I want to build machines that see, hear, and understand. And we certainly haven't really got to understand yet, which is, I think, part of this difficulty of, of automated moderation, why it's so hard. It's extremely hard to understand when someone is actually engaging in harassing or bullying behavior. It can be so coded. 
but we're getting really good at designing machines that can see and hear. So I'm kind of curious to hear from you, like, as we move more towards these AI-moderated environments, as that is being seen as the shining light for where this is going, where do you see the kind of potential for both leaps forward in understanding and potential new forms of misunderstanding? Sure. I mean, I think one uh, aspect of a lot of deep learning systems uh, uh, and sort of AI, right, particularly when you think about like addressing and understanding what the content of text is, is that you're unleashing like incredibly data hungry processes. So there's this one aspect where the sort of dream is, well, if we only had enough data, perhaps we could create the magical system that'd be able to take a tweet and say, that's wrong, you know, and automatically remove it, right? Thus making moderation very cost effective. The problem is the amount of data you need to collect in order to get there might present their own kind of like interesting uh, outcomes that we might be uncomfortable with. And so part of the problem is that the smart systems, again, that we need may themselves kind of raise these issues. Um, I mean, I think that's one, one thing at least to get us started. I think there's many others. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, question over here. So I was struck by your comment about listening and data collection. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the difference between listening and data collection is and whether we have the AI tools yet to do the kinds of things that a great moderator often does in reading between the lines uh, and into emotional context, things like that. Sure, right. Yeah, I was saying to Kate this morning, it, it's sort of funny because the panel is listening machines, but in some ways the talk takes liberties with what listening is and what machine is. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, here, at least for the purposes of this talk, like I think like I use listening to, to effectively mean data collection. But one thing that's often been pointed out is that like listening has this additional com component of comprehension, which I think goes to your question, which is, how, how close are we actually to, to creating machines that effectively moderate? At least from what I've seen, I think we're still a long way off, right? A lot of the, uh, the subtleties uh, of harassment, I think, uh, are, are difficult to get caught by machines, even though we can catch like the, maybe the extreme versions of it. Um, and so, so I guess it, it ends up becoming a question of what's the degree of, uh, what's the degree of invasiveness or the degree of granularity we want to have around dialing up or dialing down our moderation. Uh, and I would say right now we're, we're at a state, my sense of the technology is we're at a state where we can do it on a on sort of a crude basis. But I think normally we have to resort to saying, okay, well maybe we can have an army of volunteers participate because at the, the more subtle ends it may be more difficult to pick up. Thank you, that's a great point. And, and maybe one way to tackle it is to, rather than think of the AI as having autonomy in the moderation, think of it as a flag in the moderation, something right. that can point out to a human moderator, here's something you might want to look at. Right, right. And I think this goes to this really interesting question about what are the relative economics of any particular moderation system we might set up. Um, and there's a problem which I think like the scale of these platforms makes certain moderation systems very difficult to invest in, which is one of the reasons that companies have systematically underinvested in it. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think there's actually a really interesting question about like, okay, in these hybrid machine human systems, are there, are there are there things that we think can do this at scale effectively? So my question now turns sure. into a follow-up because yeah. I was going to mention that my wife and I developed a system for University of Phoenix cool. that um, based on some analysis we found moderation needed to be really timely for academic purposes. If it didn't come in within roughly 11 minutes, it wasn't worthwhile anymore. Mm -hmm. And it had to have specific semantic content. It had to be semantically relevant to where the current discussion was. So the moderator couldn't come in and just simply say, here's the topic you guys should have been talking about. You have to lead them back in. Um, and so we built systems that would, you know, the way I think of it is, to me, AI really ought to be augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. And how can we essentially allow someone you can think of it in terms of cost, or you can just think of it in terms of, of allowing the faculty to lead a life that just signals them, hey, this, this, uh, this discussion's going off the rails, and you need to intervene right now in this space. But the in the space part was useful also, because when we simply signaled people to intervene, uh, if they just came in and were not, ref you know, you have limited time, you don't, 11 minutes, you don't have time to read everything that's been said so far. Um, so we found real value in mining in detail what was being discussed and, and leveraging a lot of, of data. But I think the flip side is then you have to be respectful, which you are forced to be in an educational context of we don't own it, we can't do anything else with it, then provide an educational tool. Right, yeah, definitely. 
Any last questions? Fant oh, one here, fantastic. Last one. I was interested that you talked about the spectrum of sort of privacy to moderation, really mm -hmm. focused on moderation as potentially a driver of where our choices would be about what we feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in your logic in doing that, because it would seem to me just as an in of one, I'm more concerned about the listening turning into something like my data being sold to an insurance provider that impacting you know, my insurance rates and my credit score, which is not really about moderation, it's another form of surveillance. So is your point that you think moderation on these big platforms is really the thing that will drive our choices around privacy, or how do you see that interplay? Oh yeah, no, I, I mean, I think this is just a, a single dimensional relationship, right? Like, I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily say that like, okay, the only thing that affects privacy is our interest in moderation. Um, I, I think my selection of identifying that dynamic is just to kind of address the, the topic of the, the session, right? Or topic of the, the event, really, which is thinking about, okay, we think that moderation is really in a bad space online right now. How do we improve that? And I think the, the talk is a call to think about like what are the, all the other values that we might put value in uh, that might be eroded by our choices towards greater moderation. Now, I think there's a really good and interesting criticism of the talk, which is to argue that, like, okay, the privacy, but really whose privacy, right? Like, we could say, look, there's a really strong interest in protecting the privacy of people who, who are being harassed. And in fact, if you don't act, what happens is that like, people will harass and dox people, and that's actually a privacy violation. Uh, and so I think that that's probably the next step of this talk is to then start to think about, okay, what are the privacies that we're thinking about and what are the actors in the space? And we may say like, look, uh, by and large, the large group of users, we're okay making them submit this extra piece of information just because I think our interest in protecting vulnerable groups is so high. Um, and I think that that ends up becoming a really interesting discussion. It actually becomes uh, an empirical question then, which I, I don't have the answers to. Um, but, but I think that would be sort of the next step. Because I agree with you, right? Like the insurance one is very much a commercial thing, right? We feel weird that businesses are using our data for certain purposes. There's also, we feel bad when someone's personal information and their address is disclosed, right? And so. Quick comment here. So what's the social contract? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have terms and conditions and we have privacy policies, which are very much a one-way contract that mm -hmm. we have when we decide to become users of a particular platform. But do you think that part of solving this is creating a contract that's really, you know, between two parties instead of just one way? Mm -hmm. Like negotiated, you mean? Yeah. yeah, or at least something that, you know, society in general has agreed to in the same way that we have, you know, a welfare state to some extent. Mm -hmm. We're going to protect the vulnerable by giving up certain things either monetarily or from a privacy standpoint, you know, whatever that is. Right. Yeah. I mean, as someone mentioned this morning, right, I think it, it becomes difficult to create those kinds of arrangements in part because of the perverse economics of scale. Right, so what I mean by that is like a company like Facebook could say, yeah, we'll hemorrhage a couple million users from this choice. <laughs> Whatever, I'll see you later. Right, and, and that becomes a really difficult thing in creating sort of a balance of negotiating leverage. So then we, I think, go to this question of like, do we need regulation or do we need something else to kind of like specifically apply to these cases where we feel that like the users and their ability to just switch to another platform won't really be an advantage that will force platforms to come to the table. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm a big supporter in thinking about like, okay, what is that social contract and, and does it have to be enforced by an entity that's even larger than these platforms themselves? So I guess that, that would be my response. Fantastic, thank you, Tim. And I'm glad that we're getting questions in there about the sort of insurance and discriminatory aspects of this potential data stream. And that's something that Suresh is gonna be talking about later.